All right. It's one o'clock here on the East Coast and it's Wednesday. That means it's time for basic training. Uh, it's been a while since I've done one of these. Most of my team has been handling it. Uh, so for those of you that don't know me, my name is Joshua Pruitt. I am the Senior Customer Success Engineer here at DroneSense. Just a real fancy way of saying that uh, here on CS, we're responsible for training and operations and support. Wear a lot of hats here. Uh, today's discussion is going to be completely around flight planning. So if you aren't here to learn about flight planning, you have ended up at the wrong Zoom call. Uh, but our focus today will be 100% flight planning within the DroneSense mobile app. A couple sections on what we're going to cover today. What are your options when it comes to flight planning? How do we save them? How do we share them? Do we Can we archive them? And then at the end, after we've gone through the platform and look at some of the setup, I want to have a big Q&A discussion and hear feedback from you guys. When it comes to DroneSense, we have brought in what we consider the three main autonomous flight planning functionalities that you see in the drone space. So first and foremost is our mapping and SAR patterns. And then we have waypoints and then POIs or points of interest and orbits. Now there's varying degrees of functionality to each one of these. We'll just go ahead and kind of talk through them. So starting first with mapping missions, you have kind of three different options available to you as well uh, it, within the platform. So what we would call a 2D or just a standard lawnmower pattern, a 3D flight pan, which is going to give you more of a grid type flight plan. And then we have SAR flight paths. And the only difference in the SAR flight path compared to a 2D or a 3D preset is that the SAR flight path, if you have this toggle selected, is not going to take photos during the flight. This is meant to supplement traditional SAR operations, allow the drone to fly a specific path while the user and any other viewers on the Ops Hub side of things are looking at the footage. So we also have three presets that we start thinking about when we get into the flight planning piece. Uh, first is our PIX40 React preset. And so this is used for orthomosaic image generation. It is a single pass flight pattern. And it's going to give you default for speed, altitude, your overlap, as well as your survey and gimbal angle. There is no additional imagery required to process this information. It's meant to be a simple workflow. And of course, you know, we call it the PIX40 React preset because this was designed specifically with PIX40 React in mind. But this workflow, this preset will work with just about every data processor that's out there, whether that's PIX4D, PIX4D React, whether that's uh, Drone Deploy, Drone Mapper, Maps Made Easy, Raptor Maps, whatever your processing solution is, chances are it will work with this workflow. And so where are we seeing mapping missions coming into play? Uh, this can be used for damage assessments, disaster surveys, site scene documentation is a big one for mapping as well. Uh, large scale events planning. You know, we're throwing a large music festival in this uh, area that's, tr you know, traditionally it's just a field. But now we've come in and we put in all these assets, all these resources in and around this area. What if we mapped that out to give us better real time information uh, for our decision making process? So just think about that when we start talking about mapping. And again, we'll get into the platform to kind of see how this all sets up once we've kind of talked a little bit through uh, the three presets here. So from PIX4D React, we then have our 3D or point cloud preset. So this is used for generating point clouds, obviously, as the name is, is, uh, it implies. It is a cross hatched flight pattern or a grid flight pattern. And again, you're gonna get defaults for speed, altitude, overlay, survey angle, and gimbal angle. Now, when we're talking about this kind of 3D preset or any kind of um, you know point cloud generation, DSM generation, you're also gonna to need to gather some oblique imagery so that you have, a, you know, so that you're capturing the obliques of these buildings, of the sites, so that you're able to generate a more full point cloud or 3D model. So the workflow is a little bit more complex uh, in that you do have to do some manual flying to gather those obliques. Uh, but again, just like with the PIX4D React preset, this will work with most data processing solutions as well. 
And so where do we see this come into play? So damage assessments is a big one. Uh, anyone out there doing volumetrics? I don't see anybody from Austin Fire on here, but I know they do a lot of volumetric work. Uh, and then site scene reconstruction. So those of you that are reconstructionists that are you know, using PIX, uh, you know, PIX4D or similar to, uh, to generate your accident reconstructions, that is where this preset is going to come into play. All right. So the next preset we have is going to be the SAR preset. And again, this is, you, this is meant to um, work hand in hand with traditional SAR efforts. Uh, so this can be a single flight pass pattern, or this can also be turned into a grid flight pattern. Uh, this, uh, excuse me, the presets are very similar to PIX4D, but the biggest piece of the SAR preset is that it does not take photos. So this is specifically meant to kind of supplement your traditional ground units. Uh, you know, maybe we're not using the drone to find the missing person, but maybe we're using it to, uh, you know, rule out areas where we know the person isn't, you know, maybe large tracts of, of uh, pasture land, things like that. But again, the biggest difference in the SAR preset is understanding that it does not take any photos. So it's just meant for you guys to be watching the video, making decisions based on what you're seeing. So the SAR preset, 3D preset, PIX4D React preset are the main ones, but then there's also the custom preset. And this is going to allow you to completely customize all of the settings when it comes to flight planning. So speed, altitude, overlays, survey angle, gimbal angle. Do you want this to be a 2D or a 3D flight path? Uh, all of that completely controlled by you utilizing the custom preset. Uh, and again, this is kind of all of our mapping functionality. I will say right now, the Autel Evo 2s do not support flight planning. The Mini 3 Pro series does not support flight planning either. However, everything else supported on DroneSense will allow for this flight planning functionality that we're talking about today. So from mapping, we get into waypoint missions. This is probably the most basic flight planning functionality on the platform that we have right now. Uh, it's basically you know, allowing the drone to fly between as two or as many preset points as you like. Uh, only requires speed and altitude input, essentially allowing the user to monitor a scene while the drone flies autonomously between points. Now, before the question gets asked, no, we do not have waypoint actions at this time. That is something we have heard a lot of requests for. I'm looking to see if I see any of my product team on the call, uh, but this is definitely one we hear a lot of requests for is waypoint actions. We do not have them yet, so right now, you can essentially act as the waypoint action while the drone flies between these two points. You're able to start, stop recording, pivot the camera, pivot the aircraft around. Uh, but one really cool thing about waypoint missions is they can accept GPS coordinates. So let's look, say you have the last known location of a missing person or a stolen vehicle or some kind of thing that you are looking for. You can take those coordinates and punch it into the waypoint setup menu, and the waypoint will drop exactly at those coordinates to allow you to either autonomously fly to that point or to just have it marked on the map and be able to manually fly there. So where are we seeing waypoints used? Uh, a lot of perimeter model uh, monitoring, site and scene safety and security, automated patrolling. Uh, we've seen a lot of large scale events coverage utilize waypoints where they will predefine a boundary that they want to fly. Maybe it's the entire perimeter of the event. And then, you know, every hour on the hour, the drone goes up and flies this entire perimeter while the operator and various stakeholders in Ops Hub can monitor this. So and this is probably the simplest workflow we have when it comes to flight planning. Uh, and again, hopefully this is something we can round out and make a little bit better uh, as, as time goes on. But right now, just setting the two points, just setting speed and altitude is the only functionality. No waypoint actions today, uh, but stay tuned on that. Any questions, comments, concerns, feedback on, um, will it repeat a pattern like an orbit, but with an unusually shaped perimeter. Eric, yeah, 100%. So all of these flight plans can be saved. We'll talk about that a little bit more once we've gone through the uh, the, the flight planning types, uh, but definitely you can have it repeat a pattern. 
So from waypoints, jump into POIs and orbit missions. So POI stands for point of interest. So this is basically identifying something you want the drone to fly in a circle around. So this is the one piece of flight planning that I will call semi-autonomous. Because once you've set all of these parameters and set everything up, the drone is going to go up and fly this orbit until it either has to land for low battery or you tell it to stop. To, there is no functionality today to tell the drone, hey, I want you to go up, make five passes around this target and then stop. Uh, hopefully that's something we'll see in the future. But right now I look at points of interest in orbits as kind of semi-autonomous. Uh, so you, you, you get to set your speed, your altitude, your radius, as well as the direction and heading of the aircraft. So this is meant to allow you to monitor a scene while the drone flies autonomously between you know, two points, essentially the start point and the end point. Uh, orbits will also accept GPS coordinates. And what's cool is that uh, orbits and points of interest can be adjusted on the fly. So by giving it controller input, let's say we are, uh, we're, we're going in a clockwise motion and we want to spin counterclockwise for a, a couple of circles, simply giving it stick input will allow you to um, you know, circle the other way. Or let's say our radius is, uh, is either too large or too small. Simply by pushing in or pulling out on the right stick, we're able to shrink or expand our radius on the fly. So we don't have to land and then manually come into the flight planning menu and reset all of these parameters. It's something that can be adjusted on the fly. And you actually have the ability to, uh, just by using the direction, or excuse me, the heading, you can have the drone focusing inwards, focusing outwards, focusing along the path, or even in a completely manual way to where the drone will uh, continue to fly that orbit, but allow you to rotate the drone along its axis and use the camera as you need to. So this is, again, like I said, this is the only mission type that requires a manual input for it to end, whether you either tell it to stop or the drone uh, hits its low battery threshold. But a lot of use cases around orbit, you know, overwatch, sight and scene security, traffic monitoring, intersection monitoring. Uh, I'm sure there's, you know, tons more that we could come up with. But points of interest in orbit's probably the, the easiest to use, the quickest to adjust when it comes to flight planning within drone sense. So that kind of ends the slide deck piece. Now, now you understand my, my uh, desire to get through the deck quickly so we can hop over to the platform. I'm going to leave this QR code up on the screen for just a moment. This will get you to a ton of different links, access to our YouTube, access to customer resources, access to our Facebook group if you're on social media, as well as several other support tools uh, available to you. And so what I'm gonna do right now is I am gonna switch us over to the mobile application here so we can talk through, uh, so we can talk through some of the functionality. Now, what we're looking at right now is an iPad. And no, I'm not collect connected to a drone, so I'll just show you. I'm going to log out real quick, back to the main screen. So having been through this platform about 100 million times, I will tell you right now, if you are going to do flight planning, get yourself an old iPad or an old Android tablet for doing your flight planning. Otherwise, it can be incredibly difficult to try doing flight planning on a smart controller or on an enterprise smart controller or on an RC Pro or an RC Plus because there is just not that much real estate on the screen and it can make things incredibly difficult. Again, this is why we need flight planning to come back to the web. Uh, I'm going to keep saying that throughout this meeting because I do see there are a couple of my teammates from DroneSense on the call and I want them the under to understand the importance of flight planning coming back to the web. Um, but right now we're doing this on an iPad. iPad's got a lot of screen real estate, makes this a lot easier. Again, I am not co connected to a drone whatsoever. So I'm just going to select a training mission here and click join. Obviously we land in the map layer here. Uh, I'm going to quickly turn this off. 
But flight planning, everything flight planning happens in the map. And uh, some of the functionality you can see listed out here under the left hand side, just under the notification bell. We have a home point to indicate home point. We'll talk a little bit about that. Our waypoints, our orbits, and our mapping missions. But before we can get into that, we need to tap the little hamburger stack in the top left and get into our flight planning setup. So first and foremost, what drone are we going to be using? And for me today, I'm just going to say we are going to use a Mavic 3 Enterprise, and I'm going to use the wide angle. And you see it automatically pulls in uh, sensor ratio and all of that information. And next is going to go to actions. And you see, select an action from a, the toolbar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first select our little mapping icon. And you see it says tap to add it on the map. So I'm going to move away, come over here to Bunton Road Park, and I'm going to drop this on the map right here. And then all I have to do is just start outlining the area that I want to map. So I want to map Bunton Road Park. You can see that I'm just dragging the orange circles around to the area to basically encompass the park. I can click the little white pluses. This will give me more little bullet points to uh, to adjust so we can get really, really, really accurate with our, uh, with our map that we're doing. And again, guys, I would completely 100% highly recommend you do this on some kind of tablet or some kind of device that is not a smart controller screen because you will find yourself incredibly frustrated and will surely end up calling our support team or one of our drone sense teammates to let us know how uh <laughs> how much of a pain in the butt this is but so all right i've got the park outlined everything looks good here so over on the left hand side now you'll see i can start doing things like adjusting my speed so I'm going to crank this up to 15 miles an hour, and I'm going to fly this from 250 feet. And you see that as we're adjusting all these parameters, the flight path is changing. Some of our stats at the top are changing. Um, so we got our speed, our altitude, and the next one, GSD. GSD stands for ground sampling distance. This is basically the distance between the center of two pixels. Uh, this is going to move hand in hand. Uh, with altitude. So you can see as our altitude goes up, our GSD goes up. If I try to drag my GSD down, my altitude goes down. But again, I am going to say we're going to fly this at 250 feet, which gives us a GSD of 0.8 inches per pixel. I'm going to scroll down here to gimbal angle, and I know that I'm just going out to generate an ortho mosaic or a large image. So I'm going to crank my gimbal angle to 90 or full nadir or 90 degrees down. Once I have all these things looking good like I want them, I'm going to touch into the overlaps menu. And I'm going to leave my front overlap at 80. I'm going to adjust my side overlap to 80 as well. And you'll see that as I'm adjusting that side overlap, we're adding more passes to that flight path. Down here at the bottom, you see a couple of toggles. This auto toggle, all this is doing is taking your survey angle and making it the most. Um, so th this is basically going to uh, determine how it utilizes your battery time. So this preset, the survey angle is looking and saying, OK, I can do this flight path to optimize the battery the most. But if we have a specific survey angle that we want to fly, I can simply toggle that auto off. And you'll see now down here at the bottom, I can start adjusting my survey angle as well. So we go back to auto, snaps us back to a 336. Now, right now, this is just a, a, a flight path for generating an ortho mosaic. But maybe I've decided that I want to go out and generate a point cloud or a digital surface model. So I take this into 3D mode. You'll see that 3D mode adds an additional set of, uh, of east-west passes, basically giving us a full grid. But now let's say maybe I was just going out to search Bunton Road Park for a missing child, and I don't want it taken photos. Down here at the bottom, I can very easily toggle off the photos. You see all our little white photo capture points disappear. But for me, 
I'm going to toggle 3D mode off. I do want it to take photos. I've got my overlap set like I like them. I've got my gimbal angle set like I like it. Everything looks good to me up here at the top. I'm just going to name this one. Uh, we'll just call this. Uh, flight five no, or flight G trying to do a uh, trying to do an Apple pencil and just not having a great success there we go flight five and so everything looks good here click add to plan now you'll see for this flight it is giving us an approximation of 22 minutes, 11 seconds, estimating one battery will be needed on this Mavic. I'm realistically more than likely it's going to need two batteries. And now you see we have a couple options. It's showing our flight plan. It's showing we have one plan element, the distance it's, it's going to cover, the estimated battery needed. We see our survey down here. But if I click save, you'll see I get a pop-up that says a flight plan cannot be saved without a home position set. Please add an approximate home point. So that little house icon just below our bell, I'm going to click on that. And then I'm going to be completely, completely arbitrary with this because it does not matter. And I'll explain why. So I'm just going to drop my home point here. Click update action. And now we have a home point for this flight. Now, the reason I say that I'm being completely arbitrary with where I'm planting this home point is because once we are connected to an aircraft, power that aircraft on and load this flight plan in, the software is automatically going to adjust that home point to the aircraft's location. So again, you can be completely arbitrary with these home points. Do not stress on your home point when you're setting it. Uh, but so now I've got this flight plan exactly like I want it. I've got a home point dropped. So now what? We have a couple of options here. I'm going to go save. And you'll see it gives us an option to uh, to name this flight plan. So I'm going to say this is a uh, flight planning 101-2023. And you'll see we have a little option there that says save flight plan to cloud. So if we toggle that off, saving this flight plan is just going to save it locally to whatever device we are using to create the flight plan. Now, if we turn on that save flight plan to cloud, that means this is going to be saved to our entire DroneSense account and it will now be able to be pulled down to any of our devices, any of our drones, even though we've set this up for a Mavic 3, let's say I load this on an M30, it's going to adjust the parameters automatically to make that flight plan fit for an M30. So I'm going to click confirm. The flight plan is now saved to the cloud. So if I was to you know, X this out, I'm going to completely log out here. And you know, let's say I get out in the field and come do my login. And let's say, hey, you're being assigned to go out and map Bunton Road Park. That flight plan's already been created. That top left corner, click load. It'll take it just a second, but it loads in all of my flight plans that have ever been saved to the cloud. Let's scroll back up to the top here to my flight planning 101. Click on it, confirm. Now my flight plan loads in. Now this can be loaded in to any of my other devices, any of my other aircraft, and it will automatically adjust based on the aircraft I am connecting to. But let's say, you know, hey, I like this flight plan, but there's some things I want to modify. We click on the flight plan, and then we click edit. It opens us right back up to that same setup menu where we can come in and quickly adjust any of these parameters that we've set up. You know, maybe we have decided that we want to do you know, a 3D point cloud generation. Maybe this is a search and rescue flight. Uh, very easy to kind of adjust these things once they're set. But I'm going to get us back to right where we were. Update. Everything looks good here. And guys, this is how we utilize the software for mapping missions. Before I move on and look at orbits and waypoints, just want to pause for a second and see if there's any questions, comments, concerns, feedback on flight planning like we see here. 
Hey, Josh. Yeah. Hey, um, so back to where you saved them, I always forget there's a, you can archive those ones that you don't want on there. So somebody doesn't accidentally put the wrong one in. Isn't there a way to yeah, do that? That's correct. So if we go back to the, uh, the load menu here, I can use this little swipe and it's just swiping to the left. We'll archive it. Uh, yep. You can actually also archive flight plans uh, on the web too. Uh, oh. I didn't can't know create them there, but you sure can archive them. Don't ask me why I didn't come up with that logic. Uh, but again, for any drone sense people on the call, just want to stress the importance of flight planning on the computer one more time. But does that, uh, Mike, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. I, I kind of forgot about that. Thank no you. worries. Uh, and then I see another question from Richard. Can you explain what happens if multiple batteries are needed for a flight plan? Yes. So once the drone hits its low battery threshold, let's say we're going to use three or four batteries, uh, the drone will come back and land. No need to close out the app. No need to, to do anything like that. Uh, once you've swapped the battery, you will have the option to resume that flight plan, and it will resume at the point that it left off uh, and continue flying and continue collecting that data. Uh, but the one piece that I do want to show you guys uh, from the web console, I'm, I, I think you guys can all see my screen. Can everybody confirm we're looking at Ops Hub here? I'm, I, I see the notification that I'm sharing. I just want to be sure. Yep, I got it, Josh. Okay, good deal. Thanks, Mike. But so let's say, you know, I have, you know, there's an area that I want my you know, team to go out and map. We're working a larger operation or something. Maybe I'll come over here to this horse farm. Well, if I can just really quickly under the feature layers, if I come into this uh, this mission feature layer for uh, Drone Sense Training Ops, and I'm just going to draw an area. Actually, let's do just do a polygon. And I'm just picking a just picking a random polygon here, guys. I'm just going to capture. You know, for whatever reason, I'm on the Ops Hub side, and I want. You know, I, I need my pilot in the field to go map this area. So I'll put a, you know, map this area. Save. And you can see I left my thing on the map. So if I switch back into the mobile app, I can see that shape that I dropped here. And now if I want to, I could come in, so I'm gonna clear out this other flight plan real quick. I can clear that out. And now I can come in and start doing another flight plan based on this, you know, information that was dropped to me from Ops Hub. So, you know, a couple of interesting ways to think about, you know, how we utilize flight planning, but just wanted to show this one. This came up in a, uh, in a training class a couple of weeks ago. Um, just wanted to show it. So, you know, we this was an area sent out to us and now, hey, we just we got our flight plan set up that quickly. But cancel. But yeah, just another option to think of there. So before I move on to uh, points of interest, any other questions around? Um, so Sebastian Cordier, how do you account for steep slopes when planning? So we are working right now on bringing terrain follow into, um, or I should say, we're working on bringing terrain follow from the drone sense remote side of the platform into the standard uh, mobile apps and ops hub side of things. It's not there yet, but we'll definitely make a big announcement once we have this functionality supported. Uh, and again, that'll be a terrain follow for flight planning. And that's how we're, uh, we're going to be addressing that, Sebastian. So next, I want to move into two orbits. Uh, so I'm going to come down to this intersection. We'll do this intersection right here at Main Street and Rogers Bridge. And maybe we've had a had a serious accident. We know we're going to be on scene for a little while. We want to throw the drone up uh, to just kind of give us an orbit, do an eye in the sky for our operations. We've already selected what aircraft we're using. So I'm just going to select the little orbit tool, and I'm going to drop it on the map right there. Let me zoom out just a little bit. You, know, you see right now our speed's 10 miles an hour at an altitude of 150 feet. The radius is 
I'm going to make our radius a little smaller here just because I know the area. I'm going to take my radius down to 223.1 feet. And I'm going to keep our altitude a little bit higher, say 165, 175 feet. 10 miles an hour is good for me. Uh, you can see I can change my direction between clockwise or counterclockwise. I'm going to say counterclockwise. My heading, I want the drone pointing along the center. Or you can see we can have the drone point outward along the path or in a manual way, which means it will allow us to move it as it's orbiting. Uh, but I'm going to keep center. And then again, that last little input right there is our location. You see we, uh, I like how that keyboard's in my way. Um, you can input GPS coordinates here to have that orbit dropped uh, at a specific point. This will adjust based on how you have your coordinate format, whether you're using uh, decimal degrees, degrees, minutes, seconds, UTM, et cetera. Uh, but putting those coordinates in here will drop that orbit center at that exact location. And so we get everything, uh, we get everything set like we want it here. And then we'll click, uh, we'll click add to plan. But again, let's say we get on site, we put the drone up in the air, our teams are working this accident, and we realize, hey, we're a little too low to capture everything we need to see. So by simply giving some up input on the left stick, the drone's going to gain altitude and continue flying that exact radius. Well, let's say we realize that our radius is a little too tight. So we pull back on the right stick to expand that radius. And as soon as we let off, the drone will start a new circle from that point. So again, radiuses are something you can adjust on the fly during your orbits, as well as altitude. And you can see there um, on our flight planning information, it's an indeterminate amount of time, indeterminate amount of distance, indeterminate amount of batteries, simply because the drone is going to fly this orbit until you tell it to stop or until it has to land. So again, think about this for large accident scenes. Think about this for working, you know, multi-alarm structure fire, where maybe we have one drone kind of flying around looking at different things, but we have our one setup as an eye in the sky, if you will, giving a full overhead kind of situational awareness, bird's eye view uh, to incident command of what we're seeing on the ground. So a lot of use cases for orbits and points of interest. And again, these things can be saved in the exact same way. Um, that the rest of our flight planning tools can be used and be saved at. All right. I'm going to come down here to Duluth. It's my little uh, neighborhood town green here. We do a lot of festivals, a lot of uh, food truck Fridays, and all kinds of little events. So uh, we're going to talk through how we would use waypoints to kind of support this event. Duluth has a very small police force. So anytime we can free up our officers to do other work, it makes a lot of sense. So. We're going to imagine it's food truck Friday. And we're going to use the drone to do kind of some perimeter monitoring. So I'm just going to select my waypoint tool. And just because I know the layout of the city a little bit, I'm going to start over here. And I like my speed. I'm going to keep my altitude at 200 here. And add to plan. And I'll just keep adding waypoints wherever I want. You see it maintains the, the settings. I'm gonna go up to Hill Street. Come back down to Maine. And then for Maine, I'm gonna come down to this little input right here. And then I'm actually gonna jump down because there's a lot of parking down here in the city. Come around the parking garage. And then I'm going to come with number eight right near back to number one. Add to plan. Now you'll see we've got this eight waypoint flight path. So if I touch on each waypoint, you see the drone's heading is along the path. I can adjust all of these things. So if I want it to go uh, to stop and hover at any one of these, you have that ability but I'm gonna keep it very basic. I'm just gonna to wanna to fly these points and utilize you know, my pilot to be moving the camera 
as I need it to. So I've got all these eight waypoints. Everything looks good. It's at the altitude that I want. Again, I'm going to just throw an arbitrary home point down over here. And you'll see now I can click save. And we will call this. Um, what do I want to call this? Food truck Friday. Confirm. So now that's saved up to the cloud because I know the city of Duluth does this exact same setup every Friday throughout the late spring and early fall. It's never going to change. So now I've got this flight plan loaded. Every time I go out there for one or two, you know, every hour, every two hours, I can launch the drone. It's going to fly these eight waypoints. I can watch the camera, see if we see anything, you know, out of place, any disturbances, whatever we can dispatch our fellow officers to. Uh, but think about how we would utilize waypoints for kind of monitoring perimeter, monitor large scale events, things like that, you know, community engagement. It's a great tool. And again, there's no limit right now to how many waypoints you could add. Um, and we could even get really, really complicated with it. I'm going to go in and actually, uh, I'm going to delete waypoint eight. Um, Delete waypoint eight, and I'm actually going to delete waypoint seven as well. And so now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add an orbit to this flight plan right here. Add. So now the drone's going to take off, go from waypoint one to waypoint two, three, four, five, six, and then when it gets to point seven, now it's going to fly this orbit until I tell it not to. And then maybe if we wanted to, we can add an additional waypoint. We're going to go a little further down here. So waypoint eight, you see it's immediately tied back into home. And then I'll do another waypoint nine here. So now what we've got it set up to do, it's going to fly all these waypoints, get to point seven, spin an orbit there until I tell it to stop, and then move on to point eight, point nine, and then back home. So you can get really, really complex with these flight plans. There's no saying that you just have to do an orbit plan or a waypoint plan or a mapping plan. We could even say, you know, from waypoint eight, I want you to come over here and map this specific area. So th again, this is this is just giving you an idea of how far down this rabbit hole you could go with flight planning. And again, save this up to the cloud so now we can come back and we can fly this same path consistently event over event day over day let's think about that a different way though so if i clear all this out real quick uh you know let's say let me get over here to the chattahoochee river so right here is the chattahoochee uh let's say we're expecting a large flood or some kind of you know catastrophic event here near the chattahoochee maybe a dam burst or something Prior to the flooding coming in, we get sent out to map this area for the county. A couple apartment complexes, the edge of a neighborhood here. And we get everything set like we want it. We go out and fly it right after the, the storm has hit. So now we have updated aerial imagery showing us the, the damage and destruction that just came through the area. Let's say we save this flight plan to the cloud. So now we have, a, we have one set of data showing us the damage, showing us the destruction. Well, now every two weeks for the next six months, we can go out and fly that same, that same flight path, exact same mission, and generate another ortho mosaic that is basically showing us progress as this area is getting cleaned up, as houses are getting rebuilt as utilities are coming back online. This could be something that you do over six months. This could be something that you do over six years. You know, there's a lot of work uh, or a lot of you know, solutions that the mapping functionality really solves for. Please, please, please scan this QR code. And this will take you to a Google form that you can fill out so we can send you Certificates for course credit.
Now, I know some of you on the call have had good success taking these to your training officers and getting these accept, accepted as training hours. Uh, that's really awesome to hear for uh, others on the call. You know, this is just a great record to keep up with the training that you've taken. I appreciate you all joining in. Uh, hopefully you found some valuable information from this. As always, if you're on shift, please stay safe today. Uh, if you're enjoying some time off, please enjoy it. Any comments, questions, feedback, concerns, you can reach out to me directly at joshua at dronesense.com, or you can reach our support team at help at dronesense.com. But we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you all for your time.